All right, welcome to the panel on New Kids on the Block. We're excited to have some young regulator guests with us today to talk about the efforts of their organizations. Before we get into that, some quick housekeeping. The Wi-Fi code for attendees is in all caps, RIC2024. That's R-I-C-2024. Please remember to silence your electronic devices. Questions for the Q&A portion of the session will be submitted electronically, both for virtual and in-person attendees. For those of you in the room, you may have scanned the QR code for this session on the displays in the foyer, but if not, please take a moment to scan the QR code displayed on the screen to your device. It'll drop you to a page specific for this session where there will be a Q&A tab for you to input your questions. For those of you joining virtually, once you've logged in on the join the session tab, there's a Q&A box where you will input your questions. Questions from both the online participants and those using the QR code will be added to the same queue and we'll try to get through as many as we can. Your feedback is important to us, so let us know what you thought about the RIC this year. Uh, your insights help us shape next year's program. You can provide feedback through the platform by selecting the feedback tab in the session or by accessing the link on the RIC website. Today's session will provide a forum on a uh, forum for young nuclear regulators from around the world to discuss how their organizations are recruiting and retaining the next generation. The presentations will highlight knowledge management, leveraging educational opportunities, training, benefits, and more. This discussion will also continue the conversation from the youth panel at the IAEA's International Conference on Effective Nuclear and Radiation Regulatory Systems, preparing for the future in a ra rapidly changing environment. We will begin with presentations from all the panelists before the Q&A part of the session. Now I would like to introduce our panelists. I'm Miranda Ross, a materials engineer in, at the NRC in the Office of Nuclear Reactor Regulation. For this session, I have the dual role of leading as the session chair and contributing my insights as a panelist. I will also provide information on the NRC's initiatives for recruiting and retaining young regulators. Joining me today is Ms. Nicole Allison, who serves as a Nuclear Non-Proliferation Officer at the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, CNSC. Nicole began her career with CNSC in 2017 as a technical co-op student. Her current role as a Nuclear Non-Proliferation Officer began in 2019 following the completion of, an engineering, of a nuclear engineering undergraduate program at the University of Ontario Institute of Technology, where she earned a Bachelor of Engineering in Nuclear Engineering. Nicole's work includes conducting risk-informed reviews of import and export license applications for proliferation-sensitive nuclear commodities, supporting the implementation of Canada's bilateral nuclear cooperation agreements, and providing technical advice in various international non-proliferation fora. Next will be Ms. Alexandra Alexoya, a junior nuclear advisor from the Romanian National Commission for Nuclear Activities Control, CNCAN. Alexandra began working as a junior nuclear advisor in 2021. Her work is in the nuclear fuel cycle division, radiation protection, radioactive waste, and transport section where she works on regulatory reviews, licensing and control of radiation protection activities, waste management, including spent nuclear fuel and transport activities for installation, and activities within the nuclear fuel cycle. Subsequent, subsequently, we will be joined by Ms. Mira El-Mahiri, a specialist inspector from the Federal Authority for Nuclear Regulation, FANR. Mira is, a, is the first Emirati female to work as a nuclear safety inspector in FANR and one of the youngest board members appointed to the UAE government. She received a Bachelor in Science in Mechanical and Nuclear Engineering from Khalifa University, a Master of Arts in International Affairs from King's College London, and an Executive Diploma in Policymaking from McGill University. Last but not least, we will hear from Mr. Soratos Tantadiravit, a nuclear engineer from Thailand's Office of Atoms for Peace. Soratos owned earned a scholarship from the Thai government for his PhD in mechanical engineering from Imperial College London and started his career in nuclear at the Office of Atoms for Peace as an inspector for radiation industrial applications. His current responsibilities as a nuclear engineer in the nuclear licensing group include focus on licensing of research reactors and a national waste management facility. Additionally, he is a trainer of a radioactive source security management course 
for national stakeholders and was given the opportunity to lead the national competency building program in the transport security of radioactive materials. As the session chair, I wanted to provide you with my contact information before we begin the presentations. I'll now join the panel and we'll get started with the presentations starting with mine. Today I, today I will be discussing how the NRC is fulfilling the mission today and tomorrow. First, I'd like to give an overview of what I'm going to talk about today. I'll start with the recruitment pathways and outreach that the NRC utilizes um, for different activities. Then I'll go over the Nuclear Regulator Apprenticeship Network, which is NRAN, for the recent college graduates. Next, I'll discuss the grants and scholarships, which is for college students, then the internship and co-op program, which is also for college students, and finally, I'll discuss a, um, a week at the NRC, which is a high school initiative. The NRC has multiple approaches for locating potential hires. Uh, we, have four, we have two locations, um, the headquarters locations and four regional offices. When public job postings are made, they're made for all of these locations to ensure that we get the most amount of applicants that we could. The, one of the later initiatives that I'm going to talk about is the internship program, which really serves as a pipeline for NRAN and direct position specific roles. Additionally, the NRC uh, sends representatives to career fair events. This is a great way to form connections with students before they're um, really looking for their post position jobs and it helps create a pathway to directly connect the NRC with students. If we have alumni from those schools, we do try to send the alumni back to those schools which helps form an even stronger connection. And finally, um, I'll be discussing uh, engaging early and making connections and this really covers a lot of our initiatives. So first, I will be discussing the NRAN program. This program is special to me because this is how I came into the NRC before I started my current position as a materials engineer. NRAN is a full-time developmental program for recently graduated engineers and scientists. This program is a cohort environment and it's developed to create well-rounded regulators in areas of projected agency needs. This includes uh, positions in our headquarters and our regional uh, positions. As mentioned before, this program leverages the interns and co-ops, but it also leverages the grants and scholarship recipients. With that said, not all members of NRAN are from those pools. I joined NRAN without having any connection to the NRC prior. I actually learned about uh, the NRC through my career fair and the um, developmental program aspect that NRAN offered in addition to the NRC's mission was what really attracted me. To give you a better understanding of NRAN, I will now go over the format. The program is 18 months with the first three months spent as uh, training and this training covers everything from being a regulator to general nuclear engineering to the NRC history. It really serves as a crash course for all things NRC to help the NRANer have success in their apprenticeships. The NRANer is encouraged to work on an internal qualifi qualification track throughout the 18 months. This progress will allow the NRANer to make significant um, headway on their qualifications once they enter a post-program position. Part of the cohort experience is having monthly meetings to uh, meet together and share updates on what everyone's working on and these meetings really allow for the NRANers to tell each other what they're working on and see if maybe a different area of the in agency interests them. Also during these meetings, older NRC folks would come and give some of their knowledge to really expand what the NRNers know in the agency. The, uh, there are three apprenticeships which are essentially rotations that last five months. Of these apprenticeships, one must be in a position at headquarters and one must be in a regional position. This allows for the NRANer to experience both areas of the agency and learn what may be the best fit for their skills and the agency's needs. The final aspect I'd like to discuss is mentoring. 
Each NRANR is given a senior level manager who acts as a career mentor. This mentor is a great relationship to have when navigating new apprenticeships and determining a post position. The NRANR also has mentors who we call, peer mentors who we call disruptors. And we call them this because they are positively disrupting the agency with their peer mentoring. Finally, during the apprenticeship, the NRANR is given a technical mentor, and this is someone who's in the branch that they are currently residing in, and their job is really to help get the NRANR up to speed and understand what they need to know to really provide success and help within that branch. Moving on to what the NRC does to engage and support and attract college students. I'm not going to spend too much time on this slide because there is a lot more information on the nrc.gov website. Um, the NRC has scholarships for nuclear science and engineering degrees, grants for accredited US institutions, trade schools, community colleges, and minority serving institution grants. These programs are a great way to connect with college students about the NRC before they start looking for those post-graduation jobs. Additionally, many of these um, scholarships and grants have a requirement that the recipient must serve six months in a nuclear-related employment for each full year or partial year of academic support, which helps connect that pipeline to the NRC. Again, there's a lot more information on this on the nrc.gov website, so I encourage you to look at that if the grants and scholarships are of interest to you. Another way that the NRC connects with college students is through the internship and co-op program. These are both paid positions. Um, I know that sometimes that can be confusing, so just to clarify, they are paid. The difference is really that the interns are more temporary. They're typically here during our summers um, when they're off from school, whereas our co-ops are longer positions that allow the students to work a certain number of hours during their academic study throughout the year. Oftentimes, we convert the interns into co-op positions so that they continue to work on their NRC work. Um, the NRC tries to create exciting experiences for the interns and co-ops through our Next Gen and Embrace NRC programs, where volunteers in the agency create seminars and activities to acclimate these students. Additionally, this past summer, there were also small mentoring groups that were led by some of the members of the NRAN cohort. This allowed the NRANers to help guide these interns and co-ops through their summers and foster relationships with them. The final program I will be discussing is A Week at the NRC. This is a high school initiative that we have. It's a program that's a four-day experience for high school students to help deepen their knowledge of nuclear technology and federal nuclear regulation. The students have seminars and activities to help teach them about the work that we do at the NRC. As you can see in the picture, the high schoolers get to come to headquarters, and for a lot of them this is really exciting because they've never been in a federal building before, so it's a fun opportunity. This is also an excellent opportunity to connect with young students before they're even thinking about college degrees. Exposing young students to careers that they may not know about is a great way to leverage connections with our next generation and we might even end up changing a kid's life because we brought something new into their life. To wrap up all these initiatives, I wanna highlight the benefits of them. Knowledge transfer is extremely important because bringing in these young and eager to learn regulators allows for the more experienced staff to share their knowledge. Many of the staff in the NRC have been working for over 20 years and have a lot to share with the younger generation. NRAN embraces the knowledge management by requiring at least one knowledge management entry to be made during each apprenticeship, which helps build our overall knowledge management within the agency. Creating a support network is also a huge benefit. Programs like NRAN, the interns, and co-ops allow for the young people to join together. They can look to each other for problem solving or just bouncing ideas off of each other. And they can also learn what different areas of the agency are because they can talk to each other and learn what one person is doing in the region versus at headquarters. I know that from my experience in NRAN, I benefited significantly from knowing other people within offices. Having spent some time in one of our regional offices and headquarters expanded my network even more. I know who to contact about different issues and that arise, and I may not have gained that without my support network. 
Another benefit is sustaining a highly technical workforce. The NRC's grants and scholarship program encourages highly technical students to seek work at the NRC. The NRAN program brings in engineers and scientists specifically, and all of our programs highlight the importance of our mission and technical work. Finally, retention is overall increased because these programs allow for young regulators to be integrated very quickly and efficiently into the agency. This integration is part of why I enjoyed my first year and a half of working here so much. To conclude, the NRC has initiatives from high school to new college graduates that all support the agency's needs for today and tomorrow in the future. Thank you. Before we transition to Nicole's presentation, I asked each of the panelists, why did you choose a career in public service, specifically in the nuclear field? Nicole's response was, she first became interested in the nuclear field during her schooling when she chose to pursue a nuclear engineering degree. She always had a love for math and science and had an interest in nuclear for the role it can play in cleaner power generation. As she went through university, she did not imagine this would be her career. During her time as a co-op with CNSC, she enjoyed both the culture of the organization and the work in non-proliferation -pro and international safeguards. She, ha found, she has found the merge of technical policy and geopolitical knowledge to be very challenging and exciting. I will now hand it over to Nicole to present. All right, thank you, Miranda, and good morning, everyone. This is close enough. Uh, my name is Nicole Allison. I'm a nuclear non-proliferation officer with the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. Uh, and through this presentation today, I'll be giving a brief snapshot of the talent-focused programs and career development initiatives that are being implemented by the CNSC, as well as share some of my own uh, personal experiences and er, perspectives as a young regulator who's still relatively early uh, in developing their career. So just as a, an overview to the presentation, first I'll very, very briefly touch on who the CNSC is, and then I'll dive into three main topic areas. First, our student programs. Um, second, our training opportunities. And then lastly, some networks and partnerships that the CNSC is engaged in or leads. So first here, I'll start with just a very brief overview. The Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, or CNSC, as many of you likely know, is the federal agency responsible for regulating the use of nuclear energy and materials throughout Canada. Uh, our mandate is threefold. First, to protect health, safety, security, and the environment by regulating the use of nuclear energy materials. Second, to implement Canada's international commitments on the peaceful uses of nuclear energy. And lastly, to disseminate objective, scientific, technical, and regulatory information to the public. In terms of the, in terms of the scope of our regulatory program, um, we're responsible for overseeing all nuclear activities in Canada throughout all stages of the nuclear fuel cycle. Um, and in terms of my current role, as Miranda mentioned, uh, I'm focused on import and export controls, but in my time as a technical co-op student, I've also had the opportunity to work in a number of different areas of the organization, which I'll touch on more in a couple slides. Uh, next, I'll take a few minutes to speak to some of our student programs at the CNSC. So starting at a high level first, uh, we have five main categories of student opportunities. Um, this includes four programs which are targeted more towards current college and university level students, um, which are our summer student program, our co-op and technical co-op programs, and then also a federal student work experience program. But in addition to those four, we also have a new grad program, which is targeted towards individuals who have recently graduated from a post-secondary institution. And overall, these programs cater to a variety of educational backgrounds. They draw from those different areas of education based on organizational needs, whether it's STEM or otherwise. Um, and the duration of those programs can range from both short-term part-time opportunities, such as the summer student program, to longer-term work placements, such as the technical co-op program. Personally, I joined the CNSC through the technical co-op program, which again, I'm gonna to speak to in a moment, but I think one of the great strengths of having a variety of programs such as this is that these student placements are made so much more accessible to a greater diversity of candidates uh, and audiences. This, of course, has the benefit to those students as they have greater career development opportunities. Um, uh, for post, 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 both post-secondary uh, and new grad students, but um, it's also greatly beneficial to the CNSC as an organization as it helps us to supplement different areas of our workforce, uh, and it also plays a really important role in investing in the education and the careers of those young regulators and public servants who may then be returning to us as I did through the student programs. So 
As I mentioned, the uh, technical co-op program is near and dear to my heart as it's how I first joined the CNSC and I like to see that there's this theme of those student programs being so special and crucial in, in the, the, the path that our career takes. Um, the program here, the technical co-op program, is targeted more towards university students studying engineering, health physics, and radiation sciences. Uh, it's also one of the longer term placements, so it takes place over 12 to 16 months, and during that time students can rotate through three to four different divisions within the CNSC. Uh, while I was a student in this program, I had the chance to work with teams in the area of regulatory research and evaluation, international safeguards, uh, licensing of new major facilities, as well as probabilistic safety assessment and reliability, so I, I got a good flavor of a lot of the work across the organization. Uh, gave me the chance to get involved in activities from reviewing regulatory documents to research submissions, uh, supporting Canadian safeguards and nuclear material accountancy, um, to authoring a research paper on the regulatory basis for exclusion zone sizing in Canada. And on that research paper, the CNSC also supported and funded my travel to present that work at a uh, Canadian Nuclear Association student conference, uh, which was one of my very first opportunities to present research work I had conducted in a conference setting such as that. What I personally found to be really excellent about this program is that those placements within different teams give first enough time to learn about the work those groups conduct, but also enough time to get meaningfully engaged in those core day-to-day -day work activities and understand for yourself what it's going to be like working in a, pro in a professional setting such as that. Um, but at the same time, I found that rotating through the different divisions within the CNSC also gave me a much bigger picture look at how the different areas of the organization work together, uh, what type of work they perform, and even more broadly, what type of work is encompassed by the nuclear industry at large. I think it's such a great experience to have, especially as a student that's you know, soon to be leaving university, because it helped open my eyes to how many different paths and options there were for my career to, to progress. And it also gave me some firsthand experience as, well, as to what it was going to be like uh, working in those different environments. All right. Next, I'll speak on some of the training opportunities and programs that we have at the CNSC. One of the things I really appreciate about the CNSC as an organization is that continuous learning is identified as one of the key areas of our organizational culture, which is needed to ensure that the CNSC is building a competent and flexible workforce. Um, one of the ways this culture of learning is supported is through an independent learning plan program, and this is a program whereby all CNSC employees create personalized written training plans for how they aim to develop and maintain their technical knowledge and behavioral competencies. Uh, these learning plans are updated on an annual basis, and they're also endorsed by two levels of management to ensure that employees are supported in reaching their career goals and learning objectives. Uh, the plans themselves are used both to support building competencies related to your current area of work, um, but they can also be used to identify areas of training you're interested in to progress your uh, long-term career development goals in other areas as well. Uh, in terms of actual training, there's also a, a wide variety of programs and courses that are delivered internally to the CNSC. Um, just to highlight a few notable ones here that I've had the opportunity to experience myself. Uh, first, I have the CNSC Inspector Training Qualification Program, uh, which is a combination of both general and service line specific in-class training, combined with uh, an on-the-job training period that's supported by a mentor designated to each inspector in training. Uh, another program I'd highlight is the CANDU Training Series, which is a technical course we have on the system structures and principles of CANDU reactor design. Uh, one really great aspect to this series is that it's offered at different levels of complexity, technical complexity, which helps to make it more accessible to all staff who are interested in developing their technical knowledge in that area, regardless of what their educational background might be, whether they came to us from STEM or political science or otherwise. One last course I'll mention here is the Effective Knowledge Transfer uh, in-class training course that we have, which discusses strategies and practices for sharing both tacit and explicit knowledge uh, in various settings. Um, I had the opportunity to take this course recently, um, and I found it to be really beneficial both from the perspective of someone who has now recently begun training new staff who are joining onto our team to understand how I can do a better job of sharing my knowledge with them, but also to take the time and reflect for myself on the ways that I learned and how I can be mindful in how I receive knowledge from more experienced staff in a way that's effective for me. Continuing here on that same theme of knowledge transfer and on-the-job experiences, I think some of the most valuable training and knowledge transfer experiences I've had in my career so far have been those instances where I've been working alongside and learning directly from more experienced colleagues from the CNSC or even other government departments or other areas of the public service. Uh, just to share a few of my experiences here because pictures are fun. Uh, on the left, myself and two coworkers took an on-site visit to the tritium removal facility at the Darlington Nuclear Generating Station, where we had the opportunity to learn about some of the nuclear-related equipment we license as part of our CNSC Import and Export Licensing Program. 
Uh, the center picture is myself and my director traveling to London, England to hold bilateral discussions with some of our regulatory counterparts. Um, they did not take place at Westminster Abbey, but we had a very nice time visiting it as well. Uh, and then in the rightmost picture is myself as part of the Canadian delegation to the Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference, uh, which took place in the UN in New York, at the UN headquarters in New York, uh, where the opportunity to learn how someone like myself with a more technical background can support colleagues who are working in more of a diplomatic setting. So one last slide on trading. I also wanted to highlight that there's such a wide variety of external trading opportunities that can be leveraged both domestically and internationally. Um, on the domestic front in Canada, the CNC leverages relationships with academia to provide staff with technical training opportunities. Uh, one example that I've taken is a technical training course on SMR technologies that's offered by the University of Ontario Institute of Technology, which is also where I studied for my bachelor's of engineering. And then looking internationally, uh, technical training offered by regulatory counterparts, international organizations are also ways that the CNSC leverages those different sources of technical experience and expertise um, through sponsoring employee participation in those courses or even oppor interchange opportunities at some of those uh, agencies. All right, finally here, I want to touch on a, a couple of networks and partnerships that the CNSC leads or engages with. And there are a variety of employee networks and partnerships that the CNSE has, but these are just a couple examples I've chosen to highlight here that are meaningful for me. So the first example I have here is the CNSE Women in Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics, or WISTEM initiative. Uh, this one is a relatively new initiative, which was launched in 2019 under our previous president, Ms. Romina Velshi. Uh, overall, the purpose of this WISTEM initiative is to promote greater diversity, innovation, and equity in the STEM workforce by contributing to the empowerment, development, and visibility of women in STEM careers. Um, a couple of pictures I have on the slide here just to highlight some recent activities. On the left is a picture of myself at the CNSC's first annual WISTEM Day in September of last year, where I had the opportunity to present on my work, or my work and the work that others conduct as well in the Non-Proliferation and Export Controls Division. Uh, and it was also an opportunity for me to connect with and share with other women working in STEM fields across the organization, as well as external to the CNSC. And then the right, I have a picture from the International Mentoring Workshop for Indigenous Girls, which was an event jointly hosted by the Nuclear Energy Agency and the CNSC in May of last year. Um, it was an event that the WISTEM team at the CNSC helped organize, and it brought together women in STEM fields from around the globe to help mentor and inspire young Indigenous girls to explore career opportunities and the application of knowledge in STEM fields. And then one last point I'll highlight here, which I find very exciting, is the very recent launch of the WISTEM mentoring program, which is now aimed at connecting women within the organization uh, to set up uh, mentor and mentee relationships for them. All right. Finally, I want to highlight some of the work the CNSC is doing to support research and education at Canadian universities uh, through networks and partnerships. Uh, one example I have here is through the University Network of Excellence in Nuclear Engineering, or UNINI which is a network of Canadian and international universities, industry, and federal government working together to develop and support uh, the next generation of highly qualified professionals in the nuclear field. And within this partnership, the CNSC provides support in a number of ways in terms of participating on various committees, uh, giving input on strategic di uh, direction, as well as uh, providing funding and grants. And then in terms of grants, the CNSC has also recently partnered with the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada to launch an SMR research grants initiative, which will fund academic research related to SMRs. The current phase of this initiative taking place right now has currently contributed $9.4 million towards 29 research projects taking place over the next three years, and a second call for proposals is expected to be launched in the next coming fiscal year. So just to wrap up here, I want to say thank you again to the NRC colleagues for the opportunity to come speak here on this panel. I'm very much looking forward to hearing from my other panelists. And I, I hope this gave you some interesting insights into the various ways that the CNSC is reaching out to uh, students, whether they're in post-secondary institutions, universities and colleges, or younger girls, for example, through uh, workshops hosted by the CNSC as well as some of the training opportunities uh, and knowledge transfer practices that are incorporated for those young professionals who are now entering their or beginning their careers as public servants with the CNSC. Thank you so much.
Our next presenter is Alexandra. Alexandra chose a career in the nuclear field primarily because when she was little, she often heard family discussions about nuclear power in the field. Her curiosity led her to think about what it would be like to work in this field. She also wanted to be a part of a dynamic and ever-changing industry that promotes the use of clean and sustainable energy sources. And I will now hand it over to Alexandra to present. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm very grateful to be part of this panel session. So my presentation today will be about the process of recruiting and retaining the next generation for Chenekan. So this is my uh, outline. I will speak a little bit in the, in the introduction about um, uh, general things about Chenekan, uh, just to give you an overview about our mission and uh, the need to maintain and uh, attract the new generation within the institution. Then I will go over to the recruitment process within the institutional institution, educational opportunities, professional development, mentorship program, and some conclusion. So, in accordance with our nuclear law, uh, Chenekan is the national competent authority responsible for the regulation, licensing, and control in the nuclear field for all the nuclear activities and installation on the Romanian territory. I put it here, our nuclear country profile. So, as you can see, we have many nuclear and radiological facilities. So, we need to attract and keep the next generation of young talent uh, within the institution. As you can see on the map before, we have um, a nuclear power plant with two conduit units in operation. Also, we have a trigger research reactor and other uh, major facilities, like uh, facilities for uranium ore mining, milling, and processing, fuel production plant, uh, radioactive waste management facilities, and so on. I put it here on this slide, our uh, future project, not uh, especially for the, the technical part of them, just to highlight the need and uh, the fact that it is very important to us to recruit and maintain the next generation for both current and future projects. This is our organizational chart. I will go quickly through, through them. So we have uh, five divisions, three of them are uh, technical division. I'm working under the nuclear fuel cycle division. And the last slide about Chinecan. So our main responsibilities is issuing licensing, uh, provide the regulatory framework, and perform regulatory oversi oversight on uh, uh, nuclear safety, radiological protection, quality management system, and so on. Uh, regarding our organizational needs and workforce uh, requirements, in accordance with our nuclear law and the Nuclear Safety Directive, adequate resources, both human and financial, have to be available in order for Chenecan to fulfill its mandate. From the current organizational structure, approximately 140 positions must be occupied with technical qualified personnel. The technical expertise of Chenekan staff has to cover a wide range of different science and technology curricula. So I will give you some example in the following slides. This slide presents an overview of knowledge, skills, and uh, attitude for, for example, for nuclear installation safety. So we expect um, young graduates to have the basic science and technology knowledge from the university. And regarding the applied science and uh, specialized science and technology to be learned um, during postgraduate studies and or on job training. This is the same approach, another example for the radiation facilities and activities. We, have, uh, we expect some uh, uh, basic science and technology knowledge and the other one to be learned during postgraduate and uh, on job study uh, training. Uh, now I will speak about the requirement uh, process. So um, the work-based attraction program was carried out in particular through campaign to recruit graduates directly from the job fair, interviews with people who send letter of intent to us, uh, maintaining contact with the participant in the initiation courses in nuclear activities, and conducting annual practice program and master's program in partnership with higher education institution. 
Uh, we communicate with the University Polytechnica in Bucharest, which is a technical university, especially with the Faculty of Power Engineering about uh, the available position uh, within the institution and they publish our announcement on their faculty's website and to always keep the students informed about employment opportunities uh, within Cenecan. So as I said, Cenecan engage with universities, technical colleagues and professional organizations to raise awareness about career opportunities in nuclear industry. As we all know, in today's digital age, an, on an online presence is essential for um, reaching a broader pool of candidates. So Cenecan leverage digital platforms to advertise job opening and engage with potential uh, applicants. Um, also, the university annually hosts a job fair called Poly Energy Fest, in which Cenecan plans to participate in order to encourage the next generation of nuclear safety and security talent and to attract even more young people to join uh, our institution. Regarding the educational opportunities, so recognizing the importance of practical experience in shaping future leaders, Cenecan offers internship to students and recent graduates. Uh, so every year we have groups of students from the University Polytechnica of Bucharest who attend the internship program within Cenecan. And um, by immersing themselves in the day-to-day -day operation of Cenecan, interns gained invaluable insight into regulatory process, technical assessment and international standard, preparing them for careers in nuclear industry. Regarding the professional development, so Cenecan prioritized the professional development of its employees by offering training workshops, seminars supported by IAEA, another international organization. Also organized training workshops, seminars and conference to provide uh, ongoing professional development opportunities for its uh, employees and stakeholders. Uh, also in collaboration with Cernavoda NPP and the research institute, Cenecan frequently enrolls its employee to training courses within the training center. And by investing in the development of its workforce, Cenecan ensures that its employment, uh, employees remain at the forefront of regulatory practices and technologies. And some words about the mentorship program. So through mentorship program, workshops and networking events, Cenecan foster a culture of continuous learning and growth, empowering employees to reach their full potential. The training program with the mentor takes about six months, uh, during which the mentee shows the procedures, learns about uh, our nuclear law, the regulations, the licensing and control process, and also goes on inspection with the mentor to see the installation and understand the, um, better the control process. And in conclusion, currently Cenecan is redesignating uh, its organizational chart in order to fulfill the roles and responsibilities set by the law with its most uh, recent amendments and to safety accommodate the new activities in nuclear field. The technical position within Cenecan are rapidly gaining recognition among the nuclear industry, so Cenecan colleagues are coming from the universities or are engineers from um, other industries waiting to join nuclear industry. Also, Cenecan is making continuous effort to provide uh, state-of-art tools and e equipment for its staff and increase the salary level in order to be more attractive for the university graduates or fellow uh, specialists. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation, Alexandra. Our next presenter is Mira. Mira chose to work as an inspector in Fanner because she wanted to satisfy her technical passion while making sure that passion would serve her country and the people of the UAE. She felt that the inspector position was dynamic and inspiring. Years later, she is thankful for the choice that she has made because it would be boring to work in any other position. I will now hand it over to Mira to present. Thank you, Miranda. Hello everyone, and uh, thank you so much for everyone, all the mentors, all the great friends uh, who have made time to come and uh, uh, be present uh, while we discuss uh, our journey. 
My name is Mira, um, and today I'm going to shed the light uh, on my journey. Um, how did I transfer from a kid in the 90s to the first uh, Emirati female nuclear uh, safety inspector, and how FANR and the UAE as a whole had helped me to become the person I am today. So it all started in 1992. Two things that I clearly remember from my childhood was that I loved goats. It, my first pet was a goat, and I used to spend every day uh, in the afternoon going to the farm and playing with the goats. And the second memorable thing about my childhood was my sense of fashion. I learned from my mother and my aunties how to dress uh, very colorfully. And I think I still have that uh, um, sense uh, of fashion. And I always admire, uh, I remember when I saw Andrea the first day, second day, and today, I was like, girl, you have the colors, I love them. <laughs> And then I moved to the school, and what I remember about school days were two things. Um, my growing passion to volunteering, giving back, working in different community activities. And then the second thing was doing well in school, trying to learn, trying to commit to grow every day. And I remember when I was in school, I wanted to be so many things. I wanted to be a politician at one point, then a diplomat, then a teacher, then a psychologist. And the list kept growing. And it was only then when I reached the high school, I figured that I actually want to be an engineer. I felt that I have so many, so much passion towards science, towards uh, mathematics, and the only profession that would help me uh, grow that passion was engineering. So I decided to pursue um, a bachelor degree in mechanical and nuclear engineering. And um, I remember that that choice, as Miranda said, was mainly to fulfill my passion towards uh, STEM. Uh, and in the same time, be part of this revolution uh, in a new sector in the UAE and help to serve my country in that field. And in the university as well, I wanted to do so many things. So I wasn't only doing my uh, bachelor degree, but I was uh, doing uh, research in the biomedical um, field. I, uh, I did uh, a lot of uh, material, uh, having fun in the material lab, creating stuff and products. Then I decided that we want a club for cars and uh, adventures, and uh, let's do volunteering here and then. Um, so it was a very... Uh, engaging uh, life full of uh, different activities and I wanted to get to know to the different personalities that I have within uh, that uh, actually love to try so many new things. And the same curiosity, the same desire of learning and getting to know things in different fields continued during my professional life in uh, 2015. 15, I started my job in FANR, the UAE regulator, and become the first Emirati female to serve as a nuclear safety inspector. It was an amazing journey because it really suited my personality. I didn't want something boring. I wanted something challenging, something that I aspire to grow in, something I need to learn every day, and something that is dynamic. And I felt like, as, I, as Miranda mentioned, that being an inspector is really uh, the right uh, fit for me. And in 2015, I started, and now in, in FANR, we have more than 38% of our workforce who work in these uh, technical fields. Uh, ladies who are ins inspiring, ladies who I work with every day, ladies who uh, teach me, uh, and we always have uh, engaging conversation not only on the local level, but also on the international uh, arena. Uh, a year after, I was uh, selected by the government uh, to work um, 
uh, as an advisor to the UAE government with regards to youth policies and strategies. As you know, and as uh, DG Krister mentioned previously, that we are a very young nation. The youth population is around 60% of the UAE. And such a young nation need to be listened to. We need to understand continuously what are the desires of our youth, what do they need, what do they aspire to, what are the challenges that they're facing so that they grow beautifully and contribute to the peacefulness and the prosperity of our country. So it started over there and then years later, I reflected on myself and I thought, what else can I do? Is my engineering background enough to help me do my work in FANR and as well uh, my advisory roles within the government? The answer was no, it's not enough. So I decided to pursue a degree in King's College London. I was mainly studying international affairs but remaining loyal to the nuclear field. I specialized in nuclear intelligence and security. And that opened a lot uh, a lot of um, doors, I would say, because it, it gave me a different perspective on how the three S's uh, integrate the safety, security, and safeguard within the nuclear sector, but also gave me a broader understanding of how and why international affairs are very important, especially in the nuclear field. Within that year as well, um, I received the government again uh, recognition and support and I was uh, selected to be part of the delegation uh, to the World uh, Economic Forum. Just being there and representing youth, uh, all the ministers were having back-to-back -back meetings and uh, doing a lot of hard work and I was just there um, enjoying my time and, and learning from uh, our ministers and it felt um, extremely good to know that our leaders really support youth and support women and they action that. It's not just uh, propaganda or just words. They're actually really actioning that from a higher level and strategic level up to the working level. A year later, another resemblance of such support. I was selected as one of the very young uh, board member in the UAE government serving in one of the government entities, which is the Supreme Council for Motherhood and Childhood. It was a very um, nice opportunity, and I got questioned, you're a nuclear engineer, and you're not even a mother. <laughs> How could you serve on that board? But again, I think the diversity um, of different knowledge, and uh, different skills that are brought and that are appreciated by our government from the nuclear sector is what made me sit on that board. In 2021, another resemblance of our leaders' uh, appreciation and support, and also FANR's uh, engagement in my uh, personal journey. So I was selected to be part of the UAE expert program serving on the policy-making uh, field. And in that, it was my opportunity to inform the policy-making sector with regards to how we do it in the nuclear. And years after, I saw multiple solutions that were created and were inspired actually from the nuclear sector. In 2022, I had the privilege to graduate from the Senior Reactor Operator Management Certificate, then have been uh, seconded for a training in France, learning about material and fuel, and then met a lot of great people from around the globe who are my mentors, my friends, and a great network of what I called sisters. And today in the USNRC RIC, it's my first trick very memorable, beautifully done, beautifully executed, and it's the best place to network and get to meet old friends. 
all of what I did, I couldn't do it by myself. It started from the UAE strategic direction of engaging youth, empowering youth across all sectors. And then it was effectively implemented by FANR through systematic training and capacity building program. So in FANR, me and my young colleagues, we have different options to learn and grow every day. We get or we start our journey by training, being trained on regulatory framework, understanding the regulatory philosophy, the legal uh, basis. Then we get to understand what is our job as a regulator? What are the processes that govern our work? Then we get qualified as inspectors. Then we do a lot of on-job trainings, whether we are situated in the site in Baraka for a couple of months and become resident inspectors, whether we go and shadow uh, our expertise who come from all over the world. And then we have multiple other modules where we have um, extensive training on the systems, the structures, uh, and components. We get to learn about emergency uh, research, and uh, I had the privilege to work with Halden and developed uh, that uh, mindset of uh, research and how it actually um, get integrated in uh, the nuclear sector. Then a lot of soft skills. It's not only how uh, you conduct your job as a regulator, but how also you communicate as a public servant with the public and making sure that your job is actually making them safe and you can communicate that. So I believe that I wouldn't be here without the support from my leaders, uh, from the UAE government, not only to me, but all, to the, all the youth of the UAE and also the systematic approach that FADR has developed and put in place to support the younger generation. And if there would be one advice that I can give as a new kid uh, in the block, it would be to be aware of opportunities. There will always be opportunities within your organization, outside your organization, and you might also create those opportunities. So be aware of them. And once you kind of feel that these are the opportunities for you, go and snatch them. Utilize them, use them, enjoy them. And once late, and, and then later, you would realize how important these opportunities were to sh in shaping uh, your personality and you becoming the person that you are. Thank you so much. Thank you for the presentation, Mira. Our final presenter is Soratos. Soratos has always believed that public service is a meaningful job. He wanted to work in engineering since he was young, and upon his graduation from engineering school, the Office of Adams for Peace had a scholarship program where he completed his PhD. Working as a nuclear regulator is not usually a hands-on operation or research, but involves continuously learning, scrutinizing, and inspection of the technology and innovations of, for the nuclear industry, which has always entertained him. I will now hand it over to Sordos to present. Um, thank you very much, uh, Miranda. Uh, good morning. Uh, it is my honor to be among the panelists and to be the only man on the stage. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so, and thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, present the, some, of, some of the activities in Thailand on uh, building the talents in nuclear safety and security. Okay. So I would like to just uh, go directly to the introduction of uh, who is who in, uh, in Thailand in the nuclear industry. So first on the top left, we have the OAP as the, the nuclear uh, regulator. Uh, we also have some capabilities on dosimetries and uh, in environmental monitoring. And OAP also supports uh, the non-proliferation regime uh, of, of, of Thailand. And then on the right side, we have the Thai uh, Institute 
of nuclear technology, who is our uh, research reactor operator, and also uh, the waste management facility. And then uh, both of uh, the, the organization belongs to the Ministry of Higher Education and Science. And then on the bottom right, we have the, the utilities, who is the, um, the ECAT, the Electrical Generation uh, Authority of Thailand, who is the prospective uh, operator of the uh, nuclear power plant. And we have thousands of uh, radiation uh, isotopes uh, licenses in Thailand. Then, to talk about uh, building talents in the nuclear industry, I thought it might be uh, useful to look at the current uh, perception of Thai people on the nuclear power plant. So, there is a big data study of the social media comments, uh, Facebook comments, from the year 2009 to 2023 on the subject of perception of uh, Thai people on nuclear power plants, and which reveals that uh, the majority of Thai people, about 80%, still believe, uh, still have the neutral sentiment uh, on nuclear power plants. So, although there are um, several incidents during the past decades that uh, challenges the, um, the public acceptance of nuclear technology, the majority of Thai people still consider nuclear power plant uh, to be one of the potential energy solutions. And therefore, at this time, I still believe that uh, we still have the opportunities to convince people to receive a better nuclear perception and attract them to get involved in the industry. And it is also found that those who support nuclear power plants focuses their discussion on innovative nuclear technology. So now looking inside uh, the regulatory body, the OAP. So at the current uh, moment, the workforce of the OAP, we are all civil servants and approximately 50% of the staff are uh, technical personnel. However, uh, there is a challenge since the freeze period of nuclear power plant project in 2012. Uh, there were internal job rotations and reorganization. Also, some technical staff moved to other government uh, or governmental units or other provinces. And since the industry was not expanding, and with limited number of personnel, technical staff might not be able to focus only on one expertise. Uh, it is often that one person uh, might be assigned to take on two or three duties. And as I mentioned that approximately half of the staff are technical personnel. Um, most of them received their degrees from National University in Science uh, Engineering or radiological technology. Uh, but also in order for OAP to obtain uh, personnel with specific expertise, OAP can request the Thai government for a scholarship program for, for our staff to further their education in the field of nuclear or uh, in the national or international universities and then come back to work at the OAP after obtaining their degrees. Nevertheless, um, although OAP regularly recruits uh, university graduates, um, there are a few cases where uh, the recruits, especially those who uh, have master or PhD degrees, uh, later prefer to move to work in academics or research in instead to pursue their personal interests. So therefore, OAP tries to uh, deliver more uh, communication on the roles and functions of uh, nuclear regulatory body to the public to help uh, the graduates to have clearer expectations of the nature of the work uh, before uh, making their decision to, to work in the regulatory sector or any technical support organizations. Now, to ensure that uh, 
our staff have the necessary competency to carry out their work. OAP mainly use, uses uh, on-the-job training within each division. But in addition, OAP has recently set up a knowledge management working group to help analyze the, the gap uh, in the training and also prioritize the topic of the training. And during the past few years, they, the working group has organized knowledge management program in the style of a brothers and sister training, so uh, which aims not only to promote knowledge transfer, transfer, but also helps promote a more friendly and uh, relaxing working environment. So we also encourage uh, corporations uh, and technical exchanges between OAP and the university since OAP and all the pu public universities are already under the same ministry. And our technical staff are required to uh, write technical papers as a part of the job promotion and encouraged to publish articles on any nuclear related topics. And there are nuclear activities in Thailand from uh, both from the OAP and from the organization in the industry that help promote uh, public perception towards the use of nuclear technology. Um, OAP regularly uh, organize visits to schools and universities to communicate about nuclear and radiation safety. And we also use uh, social media as one of the uh, public communication methods. And we uh, welcome visitors from academics and other governmental units to observe some of our laboratories and to learn about uh, regulatory activities. And on the nuclear application side, there is the Tokamak project uh, by the Thai Institute of Nuclear Technology, which uh, received great attention from the public. And also there is the Nuclear uh, Society of Thailand, who is currently very active on the topic of SMR technology and uh, on the topic of promoting education in nuclear. OAP, <coughs> excuse me. OAP uh, do encourages uh, our staff and people from the relevant organizations to participate in, in international program uh, to promote the opportunity for uh, our personnel to expose to international best practice and to develop and maintain the necessary, necessary competence. Uh, there are bilateral cooperations on nuclear safety and security be between Thai government and the USNRC and the USDOE. Also, there is the cooperation um, among ASEAN countries where activities such as the ASEAN TOM and uh, technical cooperation of research reactor uh, operation between uh, Thailand and the Philippines and also activities such as the joint border exercise between Malaysia and Thailand. So lastly, uh, so there, the takeaways of some topics that, that OAP should focus in fostering the current and next generation workforce for nuclear regulation and for nuclear safety and security industry, that is uh, we need to be efficient at managing expertise and always think ahead about the future program. And then OAP uh, needs to focus on specifying, updating a clear description of each, uh, each job, each task in the, our regulatory roles and the skill sets that are necessary. And the third one is too many people, uh, especially the younger generation in Thailand, nuclear technology is still um, considered a stimulating uh, subject. And it is important for the regulator and the industry to communicate and to help ensure the confidence in technology and make nuclear subject open and accessible. 
And finally, uses of international practice and corporations will help ensure the safety and at the same time ensure the sustainable growth of nuclear application in Thailand. So, um, again, uh, thank you very much, and it is my great pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you, all the panelists, for those great and informative presentations. It was really great to hear about what your organizations are doing. So at this time, we're going to transition to the Q&A portion of the session, and we have a lot of questions. So thank you to the audience for being so active. It's really great to see. Um, I'm going to start out with a question that I'm going to direct to Mira, but then I'll open it up for anyone else, especially the other women on the panel. Um, what can I do to excite my daughter to pursue a career in nuclear, and what excited you? I, I love this question, so I'm really excited to hear what you have to say. Um, thank you for the question. So I think the first thing to do uh, as a good parent is to always support your kids, whether they want to pursue a career in the nuclear field or other field. I think that support uh, in itself uh, and that freedom uh, that a parent can encourage their uh, kids is very important. So first of all, support them, regardless of uh, whatever field that they want to pursue. And then if you kind of want them really badly to join the nuclear field, it's very important to show, uh, to showcase why, why nuclear is important. Uh, it's contributing towards uh, uh, environmental um, causes, uh, cleaner energy, and uh, all the good uh, things that the nuclear sector brought, uh, bring. But also focus on um, the human aspect. Uh, if you are in the nuclear field, I'm sure you have so many great uh, stories to share. Uh, so try to share these stories. And if they decided to pursue uh, a job in the nuclear, then, then that's great. Uh, if not, then always support them. Uh, in the nuclear field, not only engineers uh, are needed, but uh, a vast variety of expertise and, uh, uh, and skills are needed. So um, encourage them, and uh, I wish them all the best in whatever choice that they make. Does anyone else want to add anything? Or? Yeah, great answer, Mira. I think what I would add to that is, um, and what we've heard uh, previously throughout this, this conference at a, the Gender Equity Panel is the idea of role models and mentorship and having women in STEM fields who you can look up to. And I think that's important. But further from that, I think it's also important to have those mentors and those role models that are closer to home in a way that you have a more direct connection with, right? Older girls who are in, let's say, high school age and are pursuing STEM careers and finding those connections within your community, right? Spending time with those people who you can connect with on a more personal level and understand and see that, oh, they're doing this type of work. This is something I can do as well. I think even for myself now, although I'm not a young girl anymore, <laughs> in my current role within nonproliferation export controls, I'm, I'm so fortunate to have a lot of women within this group, my director, senior advisors, who are so competent and passionate and they are role models and they are people that I have direct interaction with and that I have direct connections with. And it's, it's a different type of mentor that I think is really valuable to have. I can also add that uh, I know how is it because uh, I have in my family a woman uh, working in this nuclear field. So she support me and uh, she learned me what is uh, the nuclear energy. And uh, she told me that it's a great uh, field and uh, you have to work to to see the good benefit in this field. Well, that is a great segue into the next question, which is many of you touched on mentoring programs at your agencies. Can you share a story of how your mentor has inspired you or how you have inspired your mentor? And I'll actually start with this one because one of my mentors is here in the audience. So I'll give her a little shout out. Tammy Bloomer um, has been a career mentor for me and uh, I can definitely say that she's inspired me by just seeing a woman in a leadership position and seeing her move throughout the agency. So I know that that has been a really great thing for me to see and have those conversations about the challenges that she went through to get to those. So I'll open it up to anyone else. 
I can also repeat it again if you want it again. Yeah. Uh, I can add uh, to the mentorship program. Uh, I believe that uh, in Fanner we already have um, a, a well-established um, mentorship program where you actually uh, uh, follow the lead of multiple experts. Um, I can just walk uh, in the hall and one of my mentors would stop me and just give me a technical question and I have to answer it. And if I don't, <laughs> then I have to go back and study and then give the answer. Uh, then uh, we have, um, you know, when we go to uh, inspection missions or we do on-job training, then we are shadowing our expertise who come from all over the world and they always uh, share with us the stories that they had uh, in the nuclear field and how can we avoid that. So every time I go to the power plant, uh, I make sure I wear my PPEs because my friend uh, told me that one, like a person that was walking next to him, he'd, he would have lost his eyes if he didn't wear uh, the safety glasses. And I was like, really? Or, uh, you know, they're always uh, joking around, uh, telling, yo, Mira, we cannot really hear because we used to walk in the plant without uh, earring buds. So that's a kind of um, mentoring ship that happens uh, occasionally, but also uh, systematically. And then I also have to uh, give credit uh, to the inspirational woman that I've encountered uh, into my journey. And one of them is uh, Madame Vilci, uh, who really inspired not only me, but a, a generation, generations of, of girls to pursue a career in the nuclear. Uh, and also here as I'm uh, interacting with a lot of, of leaders, uh, one of who I, I really admired was uh, Commissioner Wright and his his uh, attitudes towards uh, people. So every day uh, we encounter uh, an opportunity to be to learn, uh, not only from uh, people in, in higher position, but also uh, younger people, uh, people who we work with on a daily uh, uh, manner. So I think we need to be open to see those. Uh, those opportunities of learning. Okay, so uh, yes, uh, as I mentioned in my slide that we uh, have a training or mentorship in the style of a brothers and sister, and uh, I would like to say that it helps uh, not only uh, the teaching and the transfer of knowledge, but it had kind of building trust uh, between our uh, supervisor and and uh, the younger staff, and uh, so it's kind of a, a relaxing conversation, uh, which helps promote the exchange. Not only uh, you know the top-down transfer of knowledge, but also the bottom-up, that the feedback to the to the higher level as well. Yeah. I'd just like to add to that. I think that's a really good point, Sortos, on that level of trust that comes from establishing good mentorships where you are working together with those people who are your role models or are the people that are transferring their knowledge to you or are acting as your mentors, but also breaking down those barriers of formality sometimes, right, and connecting on more of a, a personal people-to-people -people level, right, and, and how having that type of relationship and opportunities to work together where you are receiving knowledge, but also, right, breaking down those barriers again and connecting on a more personal level are, are so crucial to having good mentorship experiences. All right, thank you. So I'm gonna start um, this question with Soratos and then we'll open it up for anyone else who wants to add. Uh, from your experience, what have you done or what has your agency done to help you feel connected and integrated into the regulatory world? <clears throat> okay, so um, yeah, firstly, uh, when I joined the, the office, uh, it is a part of the uh, civil, ser civil servant, uh, uh, the regime, and we have the, the training program as uh, for every uh, civil servant, which kind of uh, gives some introduction and uh, principles uh, for us to uh, what to do and, and how the system work and what is the, the objective of our work. Uh, that's for the, the general aspect of being a civil servant. And then on the OAP, uh, for the OAP, we have uh, 
So the, uh, the management, they uh, always have the clear uh, description of the roles and responsibility of uh, each of the department and each of the, the, the personnel. So that is kind of helped me understand uh, the roles and responsibility and, and helps me uh, kind of know what to learn and what to uh, improve myself in on, on which of the expertise that I need to, to, to build. Yeah. Thank you. Does anyone else want to add to that? Um, I think also adding to Saratas and also agreeing with that point is that we learn how we are relevant to the regulatory philosophy or regulatory world through training, systematic training. But then it takes an extra, uh, an extra um, action from leaders to kind of tell us why we're learning what we're learning and how we can use uh, those learnings uh, within our uh, job, not only on the technical level, but also from uh, a strategic uh, level. So for example, uh, DG uh, Christer, he always walk around the offices and ask us, what are you doing? How can we uh, elevate that uh, within FANA, not only within uh, your own divisions? Um, our directors, uh, they always come to us and tell us we have these issues. How can we work on these issues? And finding those uh, connection between what we learn and our fairly new expertise to, with regards uh, to nuclear and then looking into how things can uh, elevate to work on the strategic level and having the more of the bottom-up uh, connection with our leaders is kind of making us feel connected to the world and making us understand that even the small things that we do on a daily basis that we think they are routine, they're not routine and they're actually very important because they are eventually contributing to the bigger picture and the bigger goal of the organization. Thank you. So on a similar um, theme, what excites you about your future as regulators? And for this one, I'm gonna ask you all to give an answer. So I'll start and then we'll just go down the line. Um, for me, the NRC's mission is something that uh, over my last year and a half, I've really grown to feel more passionate towards. I started at the NRC not really knowing what the NRC was um, and really understanding how we affect the nuclear power plants and materials in the U.S. is something that has really um, grown my excitement about working here and I think it'll continue to grow. Thanks, Miranda. When I think about the future of my career as a regulator and where I am now and what really excites me, it's, and I, again, I think a theme that's come up often throughout this conference these past couple of days, is that we are really entering a new time, a new landscape for the nuclear industry, right? There are going to be big changes and there are going to be a lot of challenges that come along with that. But it also calls forth, I think, a lot of creativity and a lot of questioning in terms of how our existing framework and our existing policies are going to apply in this new landscape. And the idea of solving those problems and facing those problems, maybe sometimes daunting, also very much excites me. So I think it's about the impact because within the institution we contribute to the fundamental safety objective. So more specifically, specifically, the way in which we contribute to ensuring uh, safety and security of nuclear facilities, which is vital for public health and uh, environmental protection. Uh, so for me, uh, I remember that every time I attend a training course, uh, our experts would tell us, imagine if something bad happened in the nuclear power plant. How would you go back to your family and friends knowing that you have contributed to this? And this question keeps resonating and keeps motivating me uh, to look at my job not as a nine to five job, but something that we really need to guard with responsibility, with commitment, because we are responsible for the safety and the security of the nuclear power plant. And I feel like this should be really the motivation and uh, the reason why we wake up and we decide to go and work as a regulator. 
So, yes, uh, so I would like to second uh, what Mira said uh, in her presentation that it's a uh, nuclear regulator is a very dynamic job and, and very international. And so uh, for me, and I work in Thailand, but it's not only the, the industry that in Thailand that inspired me, but also uh, I see uh, what other countries are doing and I see the potential that uh, this technology can be used in Thailand or we can learn so much uh, from, from the other countries. So that is the, yeah, the continuous learning for me is uh, one of the, the, the motivation that I, yeah, I enjoy this job. So it seems like there's a pretty similar theme there, which is really great to see. Um, along that, this one's going to be for Nicole. Um, are there any changes in our regulatory culture needed to attract or retain young professionals that you can think of? I'd say, I'm not sure if I'd say the culture itself, but if I put myself back in my shoes as a university student, finishing my third year, looking at a co-op or internship at maybe one of the, the power plants is what I imagined for myself, and but where I ended up is actually the nuclear regulator, the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. What really spoke to me, and that I think we could improve on in some ways, is improving what is, what is sometimes maybe a lack of awareness or a lack of understanding in terms of the scope of work that a nuclear regulator performs, right? It's not there, I feel like there are in some cases maybe a preconceived notion of what working for the regulator means or what it can't or can't encompass. But what really struck me as I joined the CNSC and I rotated through various divisions during my internship is that it is such a, a broad swath of research, of technical work, of where I am now, policy work combined with that technical knowledge, right? There, there is something for everyone, I think, and I think a big part of attracting and retaining youth or, or new, new uh, staff going forward will be to, to improve what is a lack of awareness in terms of what this work encompasses. Thank you. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think that we need to in all areas really show that there's more to just desk work when it comes to being a regulator. So that's great to hear. Um, for this one, I'll leave it up to anyone who wants to jump in. In your experiences, what are the best ways to facilitate knowledge transfer from older, more experienced employees? Okay, I'll, I'll start then. <laughs> and uh, so for me, um, one of the best things that I found was really just sitting down with more experienced folks and just talking to them. So many people have a ton of stories about either plants that they were at when something happened or a material site. And if you can just sit down and just get them to talk, you will learn a lot. And then um, what I like to do is I take what I learn and we have an internal Wikipedia site for the NRC and I put that into that site so that way everyone has access to this knowledge because if I'm the only one getting it, it's not helping anyone. So we need to really get it and then cement it somewhere. I agree with you fully. I mean, I think there's, there's such a challenge when it comes to knowledge transfer when we're talking about the knowledge that's in people's heads, that working level understanding of how we do stuff and the historical knowledge that comes along with experience, right? And it's very difficult to formalize that or capture that in, in certain ways, right? And I think, I, one, as you pointed out, one great way to do that is to sit down with those colleagues and, and sit and listen to their stories and, and listen to their experiences. Um, another way, which I touched on a bit in my presentation, is I, I really love working alongside those colleagues who have you know, knowledge that I hope they do transfer to me, because I think it's in those settings where a lot of the, the idea of, you know, you don't know what you know comes out, right? It, knowledge and information that the, these people have that they, they don't even realize that they have, right? It, it's become so in, ingrained in part of their knowledge base that they, they might not even think in, you know, just a, in one setting to sit down and explain this, but as you're going through the work together and it comes up, they go, oh, yes, I should probably explain that, right? <laughs> yes, yeah, so I think uh, through the mentorship program, it's very important you have to to learn and to get familiar with your uh, mentor. 
And uh, also, uh, I think that the teamwork is very important. And also, in our case, we perform uh, for the inspection. For example, we perform a mixed group from different sections, so uh, you can uh, learn and get uh, uh, more experience from uh, from this. Uh, I'd like also to add for the knowledge transfer. I think it it needs. Uh, the two sides to be committed to that. Uh, experts who are willing to teach and also uh, new joiners who are willing to learn for it to be uh, successful. Okay, um, so for me, <clears throat> my, I believe that to, be, to become an expert, uh, we need to, to, con to constantly working on something like to, to, to really uh, spend time with it and to have a coach to, you know, to, to help us. But the most important thing for knowledge transfer from a senior officer to, to younger, I think it's the, it's the inspiration that uh, they, they can provide because uh, by being the role model or being, uh, yeah, the, the, the uh, telling their stories that, that could inspire the younger generation to, to pursue more knowledge. And, and, uh. So on the note of knowledge management transfer, I'm not sure how many of you have remote work options, but if you do, do you feel that it has been impacted with how you're able to transfer that knowledge management? Yes, certainly. <laughs> Although, I mean, for good and bad in some ways, of course, right? I mean, there's that element of, you know, there's a lot of knowledge transfer that just happens naturally when you're in the same place and you're talking to each other, whether it's during work or, you know, over your lunch break, you're in the same place and you're chatting about things, right? I mean, one of the, the positives of remote work in this hybrid environment that we now live in is that it does make, you know, even events like this so much more accessible to, let's say, young regulators who want to listen on this panel, but they don't have the resources within their organizations or their countries to send them all here, of course, right? But now we have the opportunity to share this more widespread virtually. Um, I mean, even thinking within my team more specifically, there have been processes that we've uh, incorporated now in our in our day to day or our routine work right on a on a weekly basis now we designate a, a one hour period where we all get together all of the licensing staff come together and we talk about cases we're working on or challenges we have questions we have that we're hoping our colleagues can help us answer or even just you know explaining difficult cases that I you know oh I figured this out last week and this is how I did it right so I think there there are pros and cons to an environment like this and it's it's about finding those opportunities to take advantage of what pros there are. Okay, great. I think we have time for one more question. So I'm going to open this one up to everyone because I really think it's a great question. If you could give your 17 to 18 year old self one piece of professional advice, what would it be? Sorry, okay. Sure. Okay, uh, so for me, if, if someone wants to work in the, as a nuclear operator, I would say that to have questioning attitude and to be able to uh, ask quest the right question, direct question, but in a friendly manner. And that will help uh, promote conversations, discussions, and I think we can get a lot of benefit from exchanging ideas. Um, yeah, and to be able to learn from uh, experience or mistakes from your mistakes or other people's mistakes to help improve, you know, uh, lesson learning and safety. Yeah. Should I go next? Yeah, anyone who wants to jump in on this one. I think I would uh, tell uh, my younger self, relax, Every, everything will be okay eventually. <laughs> I think we stress a lot to maybe trying to find out what is our passion, what are we good at, and are we making the right decisions or not. And I think what we really need to focus on uh, exploring things that make us happy, uh, whether it's uh, a class, a major, uh, a profession. If you think that this is something you want to explore, go ahead and explore it. If you failed at it, that's okay. 
you have so many other things to try. So be open, enjoy the journey, and everything will be okay at the end. All right, well, at this point, we're at the end of our session, so I just wanna thank our presenters and um, for your presentations and the really insightful conversation that we were able to have today. I know that I took a lot out of it, and I'm sure everyone else did too, so thank you. And I would like to remind the audience that your feedback is really important to us, so please use that feedback tab. Um, it'll help make next year's RIC even better. So at this point, I will now close the session. Thank you.